Dr. Luchik, you're a professor at the Royal Military College in Canada. Uh, if you've got lots of experience dealing with the issue of Ukraine's history and what has gone on there. But I look at the huge scandal that's happening now in Canada. The Speaker of the House of Commons was forced to step down after, during Zelensky's visit, no less, a former member of the SS Galicia Division, a Ukrainian-Canadian, uh, was given public applause uh, for his service in that division. What do we make of this? And why is it that Canada invited into their country people who they knew to be former SS members, that is, people who had committed war atrocities? Well, look, I think the very first thing you need to understand is that Mr. Hunka, that's his name, was not a member of the SS. He was a member of the Waffen-SS, the armed SS. So this was a military formation under the umbrella of the SS, but it was not that part of the SS that was engaged in perpetrating atrocities against Jews and others in Europe during the Second World War. It was one of many units uh, constituted by non-Germans that the Germans mustered in the final years of the war in order to try to stem the Soviet tide. Ukrainians who joined the Divisi Halachina or enrolled in it in uh, the uh, 1943 were put into battle near the Brody in Western Ukraine and the division was essentially eliminated. Um, survivors of it then retreated West, fought in minor engagements in Slovakia and Poland and ended up interned in Rimini, Italy where they were screened by the British, Canadian, American and even Soviet authorities and no evidence of wartime uh, atrocities on the part of the Divisia were uncovered. Um, so the first thing, please understand, these were not SS men. These were members of the Waffen-SS. And the Galicia division was unique in the sense that it was pledged to fight against the Soviets, but only against the Soviets, never against the Western allies. It had chaplains or padres attached to the unit. It was motivated to defend Halachina against the second Soviet occupation. Remember, between September, late September of 39 and June, July 41, Halachina was under Soviet occupation. And as the Soviets withdrew, and even before that, they had indulged in quite a lot of repression of Ukrainian national movement, as well as of Jews and Poles. I mean, the Katyn massacre, this is when this occurs. So you have... Um, direct experience of, an, of a Soviet occupation. You're living in Halachina. The Germans are mistreating you. In fact, the German plans for Ukraine were just as bad as the Soviet plans. Um, but in, in extremity, the Germans said, well, maybe we better raise a Galicia division. They wouldn't even call it a Ukrainian division. So then they go out and try to recruit people. They promise them they'll only fight the Soviets. They promise them they'll never fight the Western allies. They give them the equipment and the training Ukrainians feel they need to create the nucleus of an army that might be able to give Ukraine a chance to secure independence in the post-war chaos, just as happened after World War I. So that's the context. Um, when these uh, survivors of the Battle of Brody and the reconstituted division eventually find themselves in Italy, as I say, they are screened by the English the British, the Canadians, the Americans, and the Soviets. They're eventually allowed to relocate to the United Kingdom where they're screened yet again. When some of them in 1950 then express an interest in immigrating further, perhaps to join relatives in Canada, the United States, Australia, and so on, um, there is an understandable concern on the part of groups like the Canadian Jewish Congress, that no longer exists, but at the time it did, which said to the government of Canada, wait, you can't let these people in, they're SS men, just what you said. Well, the government said, what? Okay, stop. And then they went back to the High Commissioner of Canada in the United Kingdom, our ambassador in effect, and said, what's happening here? And Dana Wilgers was his name, looked into it, and he wrote a memorandum that said, look, all of these allegations about the Ukrainian division or the Galicia division being involved in war crimes are nothing but communist propaganda. There's no evidence of any wartime misbehavior on their part. And so they were allowed to immigrate. So Mr. Hunka, the man who was introduced in Parliament the other day, legitimately, legally came to Canada. The government of Canada knew about his wartime service. There was no objection to it. He came here. He lived, as far as I know, a normal life, paid his taxes, was a law-abiding citizen, raised a family with his British wife. Um, and now 
at the, you know, in his 98th year, his member of parliament, who was also the Speaker of the House, invited him to come to Ottawa to the House of Commons to greet President Zelensky. He did him an honor. Now, the Speaker of the House probably didn't investigate Mr. Junta's background very carefully, may have been better off not inviting him given the possible controversy this would create, as it did. And Mr. Rota, the Speaker, has paid it paid the price. He's had to resign as the Speaker of the House. Mr. Junta, however, as far as I know, is innocent of any wrongdoing. No one in all this furor since last Friday has come up with a single shred of evidence to suggest that he did anything wrong in the Second World War. So he's been labeled a Nazi, which he never was, because no Ukrainian could be a Nazi. He's been called a Nazi. He's been you know, subjected to all sorts of public opprobrium by people who've never met him, don't know him, don't know his wartime record, and generally don't know anything about the Divizia Halachina either, just because of this labeling. It's lazy is what all this is. People haven't looked at the vetting, the screening procedures. And what makes it especially galling is that we know the Soviets in the late 70s and into the early 80s began spreading misinformation throughout the United States and in Canada about the alleged presence of thousands of Nazi war criminals in North America. And this was investigated, this campaign, the KGB campaign was called Operation Payback. It was investigated and the Americans said, well, wow, we better do something about this. So they created the Office of Special Investigations in the Department of Justice. And that gave us the Demonuke trial and all that stuff. The Soviets were so happy with the way they'd been able to create tension and discord between the Jewish and Ukrainian diasporas over that war crimes issue that they said, hey, we're going to do that too in Canada. And so they gave us you know, false news stories planted in the Toronto Star and so on to such an extent that the government created the Commission of Inquiry on War Criminals headed by the late Mr. Justice Jules Deschen. But what happened in Canada was very important because after investigating all these stories of thousands of Nazi war criminals hiding in Canada and so on, Mr. Deschen, first of all, concluded that this would this whole story was grossly exaggerated, that's his, his phrase, by a factor of no less than 400%. And specifically referring to the divisi said, there's no evidence of war crimes being committed on the part of the Divisia, so you can't indict the unit as a whole. Secondly, mere membership in the Divisia does not constitute grounds for any kind of prosecution. Three, the government knew who these people were when they came here, started arriving in 51 and so on. And so you can't say that these men misrepresented who they were when they sought to relocate and live in Canada. So Deschen basically exonerated the Divisia. Security cleaning, uh, security screening in northeastern Italy at Rimini in the POW camps, a second vetting by the High Commissioner of Canada in London, the Deschan Commission more recently in an 85 to 87, I was part of that. They all clear the divisia. There's been no evidence ever presented of any wrongdoing by that unit. Now, I understand how Canadians of Jewish faith or heritage would be concerned in 1950. I mean, you know, who are these people? I understand how anyone would not want to have a Nazi living next door. But do the math. There are very few people alive from that period. This man himself is 98. There might be a handful of such people left. Doesn't mean that they should escape justice, but they should only be brought to justice if there is evidence of, of wrongdoing on that individual's part. And here's the critical thing, Jason. Way back in 1984, and I was part of this, I, I helped draft the position paper for the Ukrainian Canadian community. We said the following. We said, if there is evidence that any individual living in Canada, regardless of that person's ethnicity, nationality, gender, political views, religious group, whatever, any individual if there's credible evidence that that person participated in a war crime, a crime against humanity, that evidence should be tabled in front of the proper authorities. They will review it. And if they feel it's sufficient, they will initiate a prosecution, which should be done in a Canadian criminal court of law. If there's evidence, go ahead and judge that person and punish them accordingly, regardless of who they are, when they arrive, post-war, recently, whatever. We don't want war criminals of any kind in Canada. Mm -hmm. That was the position then. It's still the position today. So for those people who are 
raising this issue and running around and yelling and resigning and apologizing all that. Wait a minute. Where's the evidence here? Where is the evidence that this man did something wrong? Where is the evidence that, you know, because they try to say, well, it was the division, the Galicia division did things wrong. And they rely on these sort of, you know, rumors and Soviet era propaganda that the Russian Federation has regurgitated. And they just spew it all back out because none of them have ever read a book. None of them seem to have wanted to read the Duchenne Commission's results. There's only been in this last couple of days, and unfortunately, they've been rather hectic days responding to all this junk. But there have only been about two reporters that have actually said, well, wait a minute, something's not right with this story. And who have begun to dig and say, you know, maybe there is there's more to it than than originally meets the eye. Now, again, I'm going to be very honest. I don't I don't know Mr. Hunk. I've never met him. I've never met Mr. Rhoda, the former Speaker of the House of Commons. I've got no dog in this fight. No one in my family was in the Divisia. But that said, you've got to tell the truth. You've got to tell the truth about what happened in the Second World War. You've got to tell the truth about. Um, you know, what the evidence is, and you've got to also think about who benefits, right? That's always one of these great questions when you, you get these stories. Who's actually getting value out of this? Well, obviously not Mr. Rota. He's resigned from a prestigious position. Obviously not those politicians who had to rise in the House of Commons and, and express contrition to our fellow Jewish Canadians for putting someone in that position where they were applauded, even though there might be some doubts about what they did in the war and, and so on. But Jews and Ukrainians are now, there's some friction. It's already happening, right? There's been international media coverage of this from the BBC to the Washington Post to the Globe and Mail. There've been editorials, there've been articles, some of them very emotional and frankly, wacky. Mm -hmm. Conspiracy theorists have come out of the woodwork with their expert opinions on all of this. And some of them are real strange people. People who, for example, say that the revolution of dignity was, you know, stoked by Ukrainian nationals who murdered their own people in order to facilitate a coup against the government. That, you know, you've heard that story in Ukraine too. It, it wasn't the, the people rising up against the corrupt government. It was, you know, Ukrainian neo-fascists. Um, killing other Ukrainians in the Maidan in order to provoke a, a coup. You know, these are the kinds of people who are being go, go, you know, sought out for expert opinion. And others who've never looked at the archives, have never met veterans of the division, were not involved in the Duchenne Commission, are also giving their comment. And, you know, I've studied the British archives. I knew Bogdan Panchuk very well. He was one of the Ukrainian Canadians in uniform who helped rescue the uh, the Divida, who visited them in Rimini. I I've met many veterans. I was part of the Duchenne Commission. I, I I've spent some time studying this, and of course, thanks to the document that Dr. Bertelson found, Operation Payback. What we always suspected way back then, that it was the Soviets behind all of this, has been proven. So we now know it. And they use the Vizi Halachina as one of their uh, most prized um, nuggets in terms of, you know, stoking this kind of war criminals hiding in North America story. Because, you know, they were members of the Waffen SS division, and that instantly gives people uh, an impression of concentration camp guards and the Holocaust and so on. Um, so who benefits from this distraction? The Russian Federation. What does it distract from? The genocidal war that the KGB man and the Kremlin, Vladimir Putin and his Confederates are waging this very day against Ukraine and Ukrainians. It's unfortunate. It's gone on way too long. I certainly hope it ends soon. Uh, but the fact is the beneficiaries of this have been <laughs> Moscow. Professor, that's fascinating. Thank you so much for your response. My pleasure. Thank you for having me again. <laughs>